welcome to Desire Made Real, a Discovery of Witches podcast where we recap every episode of the television show, spoiler free. I am one of your hosts, Mandy Kay, and when I'm not talking about Matthew and Diana, I am talking about other movies and TV shows on my other podcast, Pop Culturally Deprived. And I'm Caitlin, and when I'm not talking about a Discovery of Witches, at least this past week, I'm probably just bored out of my mind. Aw, well that's no good. Yeah, I had a, had a not great week here in quarantine. But you had Discovery of Witches to keep you company. And here on the show, each week we'll recap the episode spoiler-free, we'll also include a segment at the end to discuss the books, how well the adaptation works, and we will likely dive into some spoilers here, but don't worry, we'll give you plenty of warning before we get there. Episode 7 was written by Joseph Wilde and directed by everyone's favorite, Farron Blackburn. I don't know what Farron Blackburn looks like, but I just picture this dude with like 80s metal band hair and I don't know why. Interesting. I don't either, even though I've definitely looked at his Twitter profile and I, I don't remember if it was a picture of himself though. Hmm. I picture more like a mountain man just because of the name, like a woodsy dude. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, well this week we open with previously on Queen Elizabeth wants Edward Kelly, Matthew has blood rage, Domenico is investigating blood rage murders, Diana's family, and Diana and Matthew are going to Bohemia. I actually skipped over the previously on this week, and I completely forgot that sometimes we talk about it. So I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> I mean, just because they're so long, like it takes yeah. up like a full minute of, of the show. So it's there. And then we are in Bo- Bohemia in 1591. Yes. It's and not 1590 anymore. They went over the new year. It's January, I guess, which means they must be freezing cold. Also, we're in Bohemia. Finally, I feel like we've been talking about that. Like, like we've been talking about it since episode three. Mm-hmm. But that feels so long ago in the show. It was so long ago in the show. It's been a while for sure. It was a, it was a whole different year for yeah. the characters. Well, it was a whole different year for us. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fair. Not the listeners, though. Just, right. Not the us. listeners, but it was for us. That's that's funny. But we are going to see Emperor Rudolph. And I like I was thinking about it when I was watching it to take my notes, because in the book, this whole section takes place in Prague, not at a hunting lodge in the middle of nowhere. Right. But I figured they didn't want to have to create two 1590 towns. Oh, I didn't even think about that being the reason. But yeah. yeah. They just had to do, like, the one building here. Yeah. And, like, where they sort of walk around the outside of residences a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that they moved it. Yeah. And then they're met by some dudes who don't give them a very warm welcome. Matthew doesn't care. No, I don't think so. I am no mere ambassador, he says, as though he is telling them that he is a spy. (laughs) Which seems like an odd choice, but Matthew, you do you. Right? So then they go see the emperor, and we learn that he is an annoying little man who has little time for Matthew, Queen Elizabeth, or vampires. This is true, and I love that they went to see the emperor, like, straight from their horses. Like, they didn't get changed, nothing. Mm Because when they went to see the queen, they got super fancy. But the emperor, they were like, Diana's wearing pants. Yep. (laughs) And when they walk out of the room, they turn their back on him. Yep. And with Queen Elizabeth, they walked backwards. Yep. I don't know if this is just like the show speeding things along or like they were actually trying to show that Matthew and Diana don't care about this dude, but it was a it was a choice. I think Matthew and Diana super don't care about this dude. And then um, when Matthew is getting nowhere talking to the emperor, Diana speaks to him and Matthew is immediately like, that's my wife. Fuck diplomacy. <laughs> but of course... Emperor Rudolph doesn't believe that Matthew has a wife because his spies would have certainly told him if the Queen's shadow had taken a wife. So Matthew very correctly says, you need better spies. And that, of course, enrages the emperor who sends them away. It's also kind of unfair of Matthew considering, like, they were married at Scepter, like, when nobody else is allowed in, basically. Right. But the Queen thinks that Diana's his wife. Oh, that's true. Everybody thinks that they were married. Mm Mm-hmm. Before they were married. I forgot about that. Yeah, so it's, I think Rudolph does need better spies. He is, I mean, he's just an annoying little man, honestly. The actor does a very good job. And oh my God, I wrote down the actor in my notes at some point here, thinking to myself, oh, remember to look up his name. That didn't happen. 
as per usual with us. Mike Gibson. Mike. No, nope. I've known too many Mikes. He doesn't look like a Mike. Although, I mean, we haven't seen him out of his Rudolph costume, so maybe when he's normal looking, he's a little bit more of a Mike. Weird. I don't like it. He's <laughs> the emperor. He is indeed the emperor. Uh, did you have anything else to say about talking to the emperor? Nope. Other than, did we say that he was immediately smitten with Diana? Because he is immediately smitten with Diana. What does he call her? Gladiosa? Gladiosa. Anyways, and then they leave the emperor, and we meet up with Gallo Glass, and we are treated to the moment I assume everyone has been waiting for. <laughs> when he calls her auntie. Auntie. Yep, he immediately recognizes that, that they have made it. And she, of course, has to be his auntie now. Does he say auntie or auntie? I don't remember. I don't either. I, I, I thought it was auntie, because why would I say that? I never say that. I'm an aunt person. So then uh, Gla- Gala Glass takes his auntie and his Uncle Matthew back to their lodgings to find unexpected guests. Yes, uh, everyone's favorite child is here. That's a weird way to say that, but Jack is here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Matthew is super not happy that Francois brought Jack to Bohemia, but Francois doubles down on her belief that she did the right thing because after Matthew left, Jack just had terrible, terrible nightmares every night so badly that he tried to leave on his own to come to Bohemia to find them. So what else could she have done? Like, I fully support what Francois did here. Oh, yeah, me too. And also, I do like that Matthew is unhappy with Francois, but he's Whenever he looks at Jack, he's always smiling. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that Jack is not unwelcome so much as he's just worried. Yeah, Matthew spends this entire episode worried. That's, yes. And jealous. Worried and jealous, yes. He he has a lot of face journeys in this episode, which, you know, I always (laughs) enjoy when Matthew has some good face journeys. Yeah. Yeah, cut to a quick scene of Matthew, Diana, and Galaglass talking about their plan what are they going to do in that earlier scene they asked rudolph about edward kelly because that's why they're here and rudolph lied and said kelly's not there and they're trying to figure out what to do about that when a gift arrives for the goddess i do like um just before like matthew looks over at the door in a very suspicious manner just before the person knocks and i just really liked that nice little touch interesting that matthew didn't gallo glass didn't but I guess it's because Matthew's just so in tune to protecting Diana now. Or is just on high alert in general. But yeah. Yeah. I just feel like they kind of ignore the good hearing of the vampires a lot. So I like right. that they put in that little bit. Mm-hmm. And of course, Matthew cannot stand that Rudolph sent Diana a gift. And oh, and Galaglass is the best line here when he says, the goddess. I assume that's not you, Matthew. <laughs> Of course not. Of course not. I do enjoy the amount of gallo glass we get in this episode. It is a fair amount. And he is, I, I wish that we knew him better, but it's yeah. nice to, especially because in the next scene, it's just Diana and gallo glass for a minute. Mm-hmm. And I like that. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, just before that, though, we have Diana talking to Matthew from, like, she's in bed and he's standing around because he's a vampire. And he says, I take it you saw how hostile the emperor was? And she slaps back with, I saw how hostile he was towards you. (laughs) And that was good. Yeah. She plays on that a lot this episode of, like, but I mean, I think rightly so, because clearly there's some hostility between Matthew and Rudolph, but he's smitten with her. And so she should take advantage of that and yeah, exploit exactly. it to get what they need and Matthew doesn't want her to and so she's just constantly like butting heads with him on whether or not she should be even talking to him yeah well if it was any other woman Matthew would be like absolutely mm-hmm. go flirt with him but yeah because it's Diana Matthew just can't but she convinces him and Diana is allowed to go see him with Gallo Glass as her escort yes and this next day, she's wearing the dress that is in all the promotional images. And I really like the design on this one. I am not super fond of the dress itself, but I love her hair. Oh. I will say, like, the style of the dress, like the Elizabethan dress, does little to nothing for me. I just like, I like the fabric, I suppose is what I mean. Mm. The gold with the shininess. Yeah. I, I like that. 
I liked her hair this entire episode, Mm -hmm. especially later when she goes back to the blue dress and she's got the blue ribbons in her hair. I am fairly certain that that blue dress is the only dress she wears more than once. Oh, interesting. Because we have, I oh, shoot. We have already seen it and we're going to see it in another episode to come. I think that that's interesting. Okay. I just remember noticing the ribbons because <laughs> I really liked those. It's a nice dress. So despite Rudolph being super smitten with Diana, Diana still has to wait in line to bring him a gift. I think before, or maybe it is, yes, she still has to wait in line. And then we cut to like uh, Matthew and Pierre on an adventure together, which I really like. I like the idea of it, but it makes Matthew seem so clever and Pierre not. I, well, I mean, how so? Because, like, Pierre's just like, well, we didn't find him. There's no Edward Kelly in the ledger that he's holding. And Matthew's like, oh, no. But there was an English man, you know, in there. And he's like, oh. And then he's like, well, but he didn't have an appointment until just a week ago. And then Pierre's like, oh. Right. So like Matthew, they both looked at the ledger, but Matthew's the only one who picked up on all of these clues. And then he's having to explain to Pierre. I mean, that's for the audience's benefit. But yeah, I guess I guess I hear what you're saying. I just I I, before all that, though, I do love how since Matthew has let Diana go off without him, Pierre just looks at him and immediately says she'll be all right. And Matthew does his trademark. Hmm. Hmm. (laughs) Hmm. I didn't even think about how they were kind of making Pierre the not smart one. One thing that does happen while we are watching Diana and Gallo Glass wait in line, because these two these two stories are happening simultaneously and there are a lot of quick cuts back and forth between. And yes. so like I don't want to just like go, well then Diana did this and then Matthew did this, right? Um but so Diana and Gallo Glass are waiting in line. We find out for sure that Gallo Glass does know they're from the future. Yes. We never saw them tell him. But Diana specifically says, well, you know, he's changed a lot in 400 years, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And um, then Gallo... Go ahead. Well, I I think Rob's going to say the same thing, so you go. Um, Gallo Glass gets impatient, doesn't want to wait, so he runs off to try and speed things along. I was actually going to say something different. Oh, okay. (laughs) What were you going to say? Just before he does that, he does mention that the blood rage will be harder to control now that they are mated. Mm. Which I think is kind of what this episode is about in a relationship way yeah i think so because they it's very heavy in this yeah. episode but so, then yes galaglass does get impatient and he runs off and then we meet a random character so random yes a random vampire comes down the stairs who can see the blood valve from philippe or sense or here wow. maybe here because like the heartbeat got really loud as he was walking by yeah, something like that. And therefore, he feels that he needs to stop and introduce himself as Benjamin Fuchs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this completely random person who is not important in any way to the Yeah, we don't see are... him at the end of the episode murder someone in exactly the same way people are being murdered in modern day. Right? Not at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, God, the show has been... I don't know, like keeping this in so close to the chest and still not really revealing anything with this dude. Yeah. Um, All we know is his name at this point and that he's a vampire who is kind of a loner. And that he is beneath the interest of the de Clermonts. Oh, and he mentions that he was expelled from his own clan. Mm -hmm. Ostracized. Yeah. Kicked out. Whatever. I forget his actual word. I think it was, I actually think it might have been expelled. I don't remember. I guess I just associate that word with, like, school punishment. So Mm -hmm. after I said it, it sounded weird. But I don't think I would have said it unless he also had. So Right. Yeah. Oh, it's really, really hilarious because Galaglass gets Diana in by outright lying to Rudolph that she has this super valuable painting. Yes, it put her in such an odd spot. Like, dude, Teresa Palmer's face in, like, showing... I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what to do right now, but I have to save it and I can't let Rudolph know that I'm uncomfortable. Yep. She nailed that. It was really difficult for me not to skip past it because it made me feel so uncomfortable. Because <laughs> I was just like, I can't, I, I don't want to be in this situation ever in my life. Right. And Galaglass doesn't look repentant at all. He just like is hanging out in the back with his little eyebrow cocked like she can handle this. Like I got her in. What else do you want me to do? I feel like that is the very, 
I don't know how to say what I'm saying. Jeez. Um, I feel like the Claremont vampires are very arrogant mm. because they are kind of like royalty of the vampire world. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair assessment. So it makes sense. But, you know. And then because Diana's Diana, she still manages to completely charm Rudolph. Even though she gives him a book he has no interest in whatsoever. Although, I mean, I wish they had gone more into that book, but whatever, not important. How do you want to do this? I mean, because it just keeps going back and forth between Rudolph and Diana and Matthew and Pierre. I guess we can just sort of finish up the Matthew and Pierre bit. They, uh, Matthew lies to somebody about being Edward Kelly, therefore finding out that people in the town have seen, or in the town, in the area, whatever, have seen Edward Kelly because they know he's not him. And then Matthew and Pierre do a little B&E, which, <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a good time. Right. And like we were talking about before, they get the ledger and decide to come back during this guy's appointment with the alchemist, no, apothecary, to see if they can intercept Edward Kelly. Yep. And apparently Pierre is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Not dumb, just... He, he's the audience stand-in. He is. He is absolutely the audience stand-in there. Um, but usually that's done better. Because Diana is so charming to Rudolph and manages to make him interested in a book he's not interested in, he decides to take her to see his rabbi that he has on staff. Rabbi Lowe. Rabbi Lowe. And he has a great, great quote here. I love it. He says, I have no knowledge that cannot be learned by anyone with sufficient reading, Jew or Gentile. I... A, I really love this character from the book, and I'm so glad they didn't cut him because I feel like he would have been an easy character to cut. Mm-hmm. And I, the actor does, he, he has very little, but he does an amazing job with it. Mm-hmm. And I, I really like him. Yeah. And then they all go into the Emperor's Kunstkammer. Or his traveling collection of oddities, as I've written it down in my notes. The Cabinet of Curiosities. Yep. There's a horn of a unicorn in there. There's a lot of weird things in there. And this is also where Rudolph, you know, kind of oddly mentions to the rabbi that there are rumors of a man made of clay in Prague who comes to life. Yes, a golem. And the rabbi is just like, they're just rumors. I don't know what you're talking about. And then we move on to other things. That, I think, is like a Easter egg for people who've read the book. Okay. So it doesn't come to anything? It does in the book. But it it does not in the show, no. Okay, okay, it doesn't in the show, interesting. Diana stokes Rudolph's ego, which is basically all she does in this episode. And I do love how during all of these, like, Diana talking to the emperor, we keep sort of cutting to Gallo Glass snooping in the corners and looking around. Mm -hmm. Then we cut back to Matthew and Pierre intercepting Edward Kelly, because surprise, surprise, this secretive man with an English name is actually Edward Kelly, who is under guard because he is a prisoner. Right, yes. Well, he's is he a prisoner? Like, it seems like he's being kept under guard, but it also seems like he doesn't want to leave. He doesn't want to leave the book. Yeah. But, I mean, he's kept chained in a dungeon. He's definitely yeah, a prisoner. <laughs> it's interesting. He kind of starts raving like a madman. We get him quoting the original passage from the books. It begins... Yeah. With absence and... Desire. Desire. Blah, blah. Yeah. I should know this by heart because we said it a lot last season. It, yeah. It opened every episode last season. It did. It did. random dude is screaming it at Matthew. It begins with a discovery of witches. I know that much. Uh, it begins with absence. It begins with uh, blood and fear, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then it begins with a discovery of witches. Yeah. Yep. And then the guards just take him away and we cut to the next morning. When a witch, a vampire, and a Jew meet in secret. Oh, I did want to actually mention before that that Edward did know that Matthew was a vampire. And I feel like everybody that we meet just knows that Matthew is a vampire. I'm like, good job keeping that secret past Matthew. <laughs> well, it seems like all of the important people know that creatures exist and the general public doesn't. And because Edward Kelly has been like in the Queen's Council and now is part of Rudolph's court or whatever it makes sense that he would know i get i wonder if that's true in the modern day stuff too like does the prime minister of england know hmm probably creatures the queen probably but i Hmm. don't know but yes sorry matthew and diana are off to see the rabbi i do love 
Diana says, Rudolph has been nothing but kind to me. But, like, it's because he thinks she's hot. Right. Like, <laughs> obviously, Diana. But she says it like she's trying to, like, uh, defend him. And I'm like, but you know that's why he's being kind to you. Yeah. Uh. Um, I really like the rabbi here in this scene. They do get to the book very quickly. Um, the rabbi has seen the book and can't read it. And when he's talking about why he's afraid for Rudolph to find out that he can't, mm-hmm. like his whole, like his face, his demeanor, his physicality, you can all see like he's afraid that Rudolph yes. is going to kill him because he can't read this book. And I just enjoyed the performance. He also has a great line when they first walk in where he says, a witch, a vampire, and a Jew meeting in secret. It would set Christian tongues wagging for miles around. Mm -hmm. And since they did have to move this out of Prague, there wasn't a good way for them to show the the persecution of the Jews that we do see in the book. So I'm glad that they kept it in here because I feel like maybe some people just don't know how long anti-Semitism has been with us. Yeah. Yeah, because Diana points out the the yellow circle on his his robe and... And it's he's a, like the best person they meet in, in Bohemia, you know? Oh, and yes, hands he down. just gets shit upon. As per, from what I have heard, <laughs> the Jewish lot in life. Uh, we do cut to a much more fun scene where Jack is beating Gallo Glass at cards. Now, do you think genuinely Jack is beating him? Because, you know, he grew up on the streets. He might have some skills. Or do you think Gallo Glass and I think Pierre is playing also are allowing Jack to win? Oh, they're totally letting him win. Oh, I like the idea that Jack is actually beating them. <laughs> but I do think the other way is probably more likely. Diana, uh, Jack lets them know as they walk in that Diana has a letter from mm-hmm. the emperor. And it is only for Diana. She has been summoned to a pheasant hunt. Yay. Everyone's favorite pastime. Right? And not for the first or last time in this episode, Matthew and Diana fight about her going to spend time with Rudolph. Yep. But Gallo Glass pipes up with a wonderful plan. That is exactly my note also on that scene. Go ahead. Oh, no, my note was just Gallo Glass coming through with a good plan. Oh. Uh, so they decide that Diana and Matthew will both go to the hunt and Gallo Glass will break into the Cabinet of Oddities to find the book. I, uh, some more B&E. Everyone's favorite. Yeah, there's a lot of that in this episode. I like it. And then we get to the pheasant hunt, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, and yep. then Matthew is not welcome, but he's going to be given a hawk, falcon, falcon, to um, use in the hunt. <laughs> Anyways, the emperor has this line about his own falcon, who is called Artemis, where he says, Artemis will be mine, Matthias. And I'm like, yes, dude, we get it. You want this man's wife. Yeah. <laughs> and so he gives Matthew the, the tiny falcon <laughs> to hunt with. Oh. And Diana says, play nice. And then Matthew just growls. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of growling in this episode. And so I love that last week we talked about how his growling is actually Matthew good. Like, oh, my damn. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> so we cut to Gala Glass breaking into the storage area and searching. But he ends up very shaken by something that he finds that we don't see at that point. Well, for I mean, so for uh, first of all, we do have Gala Glass reminding us that they are vampires. <laughs> Because he actually gets to do some stuff a human could not do. Which I think genuinely might be the first time this season. I mean, we've seen the running, like, really fast. Oh, that's true. Um, but I think, yeah, this is, like, the first. He does the jump down the hole and yeah. almost has a superhero landing, but not quite. Yeah. And then before the thing that disturbs him, he finds a brain in a jar, which disturbs him less than whatever he uncovers. Yeah. Which is interesting. I, I feel like the brain in the jar would disturb me the most, but that's 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 me. I don't know. I mean, given that we find out that in, in the next bit that it's a mummified hand, like I think the hand would disturb me more than the brain in the jar, honestly. Interesting. I don't know, because we can see people's hands. I've never seen a brain before. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we cut back to the pheasant hunt where Matthew is just getting more and more and more and more jealous. He can't handle it. I despise this scene. I think it's stupid. It is stupid. Diana is way overplaying her hand here and being so obvious. Matthew is just staring in a stupid way. And like, how? How in the world would he have gotten his bird to attack the emperors? Like, look, I know nothing about falconing, falconer, falconry. Sure, whatever. But how? How would he have gotten his bird to attack the emperor's bird like that? It doesn't make any sense. This whole scene is dumb. (laughs) 
If I recall correctly, and remember, it has been a very long time since I read the books. This happened in the books, and I feel like Matthew had some sort of mental connection with the bird. So yes, this scene definitely happened in the book, and I definitely read it very recently, and I have no memory of it. <laughs> okay. So I feel like it made sense in the book, but it doesn't make sense in the show. Um, but he sends his tiny little bird to actually attack Rudolph's falcon and <laughs> instead of the prey. And Rudolph's reaction, he says, you broke my bird. Yep. What does that even mean? You broke my bird? I mean, I think he killed the bird. Right. And then he decided to have a five-year-old reaction to it. Yeah. I agree. Do not like this scene at all. It just felt long and stupid. And like, we get it. The emperor is interested in Diana and Matthew's upset about it. Yeah. And given that very, like, not long after this, the emperor apologizes and sends them an invitation to come back. Like, this whole scene could have been cut. Yep. Like, they, I mean, I, I get that it was there to show us that the Emperor was preoccupied while Galloglass was doing his breaking and entering. Well, but that could have been done a completely different way. I guess it was technically there to inspire the next scene where Matthew's very angry. Oh, fair. Yeah, but I feel like they could have done that a different way, too. It didn't have to be the birds. Yeah. Well, anyways, then we, we go back to their lodging area, and Galloglass is there and does warn them about. Or tells them about the hand and the brain. The hand belonging to a witch, the brain belonging to a demon, and he also found some teeth that belong to a vampire. Yes, Rudolph is collecting bits of creatures, which is not disturbing at all. No, sounds like a good dude for a good time. Mm. And then Matthew and Diana fight again. I like this one, though. I do like this one because of the growling, honestly. The growling <laughs> oh. and the fire. Yeah, the growling's good. And, and yeah, that she just won't let him leave until they have this out because he, mm-hmm. he he just wanted to walk away. Yeah. I love that, that he distinguishes, like, she, she keeps insisting, you won't hurt me. And mm-hmm. finally, he just explodes, no, I won't hurt you, but I would hurt other people for you. And he's worried about that, too. Yes, I love that line. I love that he acknowledges that he would kill everyone ever for her mm-hmm. and that he doesn't like that about himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, So he tries to walk away because he wants to, you know, get control of himself. Diana sets the door on fire so he can't leave. And so calmly, she just says, we're not done speaking. Yes. Like, yes, that is such a good line. And she makes him stay and they talk it out. And she she brings him down. And we Mm -hmm. get some of that crazy face acting from Matthew Good again. Especially when she reaches out and touches his face. And his eyes are like solid black circles. And like bulging out. And it looks like like the veins in his neck are bulging out. And it's just really good. I don't know how actors do that stuff. Yeah, he had... uh, There were a couple times in this episode where like the veins in his forehead would pop out. Yeah. like, how do you do that on demand? I have no idea. I do not have that much control over my body. And for somebody to have it and be able to do it is just completely awe-inspiring to me. Yes, I, yes, I agree. You said that perfectly. (laughs) So eventually he does calm down and then they make out. And so I have two notes about this scene. So A, I wrote down, is it wrong that I wish this scene was more, I don't know, like hotter or more intimate or something? I don't know. It felt kind of incomplete. But also... B, he does finally grab her butt here, which is the first time this season, so I'd like that we return to that. (laughs) Caitlin, all about the butt grab. (laughs) That's fantastic. I think because of the way the next scene starts, I understand why it couldn't have been more intimate because the next scene starts with Galaglass just does a quick knock on the door and then he just comes in. It's like they don't really have private intimate time. But I mean, the implication is that they do have sex. They just don't undress. Fair. That's fair. Although, okay, something that I can't believe we've never mentioned before. Matthew, like when Galloglass walks back in, Matthew's in his white shirt that he wears under all of his Mm -hmm. outer layer things. I know the names of clothing. (laughs) Which he's worn a lot, especially like when they're at home and stuff. And it has the deepest of Vs. Like It it does, yeah. It's like wearing a button up and not buttoning up the, the top four buttons. It's insane how deep that V is, and I can't believe we haven't talked about it before because it's around so much. I just wanted to mention it. Noted. It has been mentioned. But I do love Kelloglass looking at the burned door and then nobody acknowledging it. Yep. 
Yep, he just gives him this look, and it's fantastic. And, of course, he's bringing the emperor's apology and word that he is summoning them both that evening. And why does he think the emperor changed his mind? I don't know, honestly. Like, it's not played super well. Um, It could be that he just realized he doesn't need to have the queen's shadow on his bad side. Or it could be that he's finally starting to realize that the rabbi can't read the book and maybe diana can because she keeps asking about it and is interested in alchemy but i don't think that's it that one makes sense to me i guess that maybe he wants to see or maybe he wants to show diana that he's gonna do something mean evil i don't know to the rabbi to show her that this is what happens to people i don't like also a possibility yeah i guess yeah Hmm. it just seems to come out of nowhere Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense, especially since whenever they get there, Matthew tries to apologize, you know, clearly not wanting to. And it's just like diplomacy, politeness. But Rudolph is like, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah. It's just weird. I think that this, so they've changed something here. They've kind of moved some things around in the relationship. And I, which, so I think it makes it awkward that suddenly Matthew is in a better mood just because they had sex. (laughs) Because I don't know, it. Because in the book, like, something, like, big happens to their relationship there, and it makes sense that he is a little bit more trusting. Mm. But they don't have that happen here. And so it's literally just, like, maybe he was just horny. (laughs) Well, you know, sex with his beautiful wife is certainly a reason to be in a better mood. It's true. All right. So then we're back in the Kunstkammer, which is, I enjoy saying that word probably incorrectly. (laughs) And Diana asks if there's anything that he doesn't, you know, keep on public display. And then the emperor says, is there something in particular you wish to see? You wish to see? And I'm like, she's literally been asking about a book since she first talked to you. Right. (laughs) So it's like person number two who is dumb for no reason in this episode. (laughs) But yeah, then the rabbi comes in and the emperor publicly shames him i don't even know like is he taken off to be arrested i don't know what happens there but he does say something about the typical low cunning of his people and fuck you sir yeah yeah this whole public humiliation thing and you know just anti-semitism is awful and frustrating and it makes me hate this annoying little man even more than i already did yep and then he has the audacity to call diana a charlatan But then Diana makes a snake, her favorite thing to do, apparently. Right. But um, she says in that in that way of hers, you know, she like just does this big, powerful thing. And she just looks at him and is like, I am no charlatan. And it's like, I am no man. (laughs) Tell me you didn't think of the same reference when she said it. I genuinely did not. You didn't. Which is weird for me. (laughs) And then Matthew and Galagos trying to look unassuming while they have this snake is Right, because they look so suspicious. Right, and then Galaglass just like dunks it in a vase. Yeah. He's like, oh, there's a hole. I'll put the snake in there. I can't help but think of some poor lady just like looking at the urn vase, whatever it is, later, and a snake just climbs out of it. Oh, no. Climb? No, 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 no. Slither? Eh, I think that that would be a fun time. Mm, your definition of fun and mine are very different. Oh, no, so fun in the show, if we saw that, I wouldn't want that to be me. Oh, you just want to watch it happen to somebody else. I yes, got you. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, Diana's show of power is enough for Rudolph to take her to see the book. Yes. I, I also like how in both the, the scene with the snake and when they first see Kelly, Diana's just like, fuck it, I'm using magic. Yeah. She's like, this is stupid. We're not getting anywhere. Yeah. I'm going to do what I do. And she does. And so she gets the book and then we see the missing pages. Which are, the the first one is the tree of life with a sun on one side and a moon on the other, I believe. And then we see the page that, um, you know, the house spat out at Diana in season Mm -hmm. one. And then we see another page that has two intertwined dragons on it that are shedding their blood. Mm -hmm. Some of those specifics I know from a later episode. (laughs) Yeah, I was struggling to figure out what exactly we were looking at. Um, I mean, it was beautiful, and I mm-hmm. loved the effects of how they showed us what was in the book. Yes. But there, it was chaotic in the room, and the camera wasn't just focusing on Diana and the book. It was kind of everywhere. And so yeah. I was having a hard time kind of really understanding what was what images we were looking at. I saw the tree and the sun, and I saw at least one dragon. 
the bit with they're sort of like uh intertwined mm-hmm. uh to get like twisted is the word i was trying to twist it around each other yeah so this is the most action anybody's ever gotten out of this book. And so, of course, Rudolph decides, well, I don't need Edward Kelly anymore. I have Diana and tries to take her. I love when the guards grab her and she just looks at them like, what are you doing? I'm reading my book. <laughs> like she's genuinely shocked and surprised. Yep. In the ensuing scuffle, Edward grabs the book um, and tears a page from it, which Diana completely freaks out about, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, But she does get the book back by punching him in the face, which I enjoyed very much. And then they, Matthew and Diana and Galloglass, run out with the book and flee. Uh, My note here was Galloglass carves a path. That is accurate because they have to run all the way back up to the party and get through the party and get out and then run and he, to the yeah, gate. He just pushes everyone out of the way. I'm pretty sure at one point Matthew killed a dude. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> but in the cell, it kind of looked like he snapped somebody's neck. Mm. Not the emperor, though. So I thought that was a good restraint. Yeah. For, on his part. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the sex was helping out. <laughs> or continued Gave him some, to help out. Some vigor. Yeah. And then just before they get on their horses to flee, um, Matthew mentions that he notices the book is made with the skin of creatures. Yes, the pages are creature skin, the binding is hair, and the ink is their blood. And I had to rewind this next part to see what it was he actually said. But he said, I'm sorry, Diana, but this is more like a book of death. Yes. And he gives it back to her because he's holding it. I think it looks like he's going to take it and store it in one of his saddlebags or whatever. And when he says that it's a book of death, he gives it back to her. It's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Oh, I didn't even think of that of it that way. I thought he was just like, it's yours. Here you go. Hmm. Maybe, but it doesn't make sense for the, him to stop and just kind of look at it in that moment. Well, anyways, um, we find out that Francoise has gone on with Jack and is waiting for them somewhere. And I find this interesting because, like, I get that Jack was here in the book. And sure, I love having him in more scenes. But why was he here? He did nothing. Just because it's important for reasons for us to understand that there is a bond between Jack and Matthew and I Diana. guess. I guess. I for just, reasons. I suppose. I suppose. Uh, it just felt kind of like, eh, he did nothing. Like in the book, he he had like a he had some good information. Well, I mean, they kind of lived there for a lot longer in the book, but he had explored and had good information about some stuff that they needed. So it made sense that he was there plot wise. But mm-hmm. it, it's just like, oh, Jack's here. That's fun. It is fun. All right, and then we have a return of the mysterious Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> you are always going to be the one who says that name on the podcast forevermore. I'm saying it differently every time, so that's fun. Yep. Looks like he uh, murders a Kelly. I wasn't sure if he actually murdered Kelly in that moment or not. Oh, no. So, yeah, you're right. You're right. He murders the guard in the same way that we've seen the murders be happening in modern day. Wait, that was I thought it was the emperor that he killed. No, it was just a guard. Oh, huh. I wonder if you watched that. I watched it twice, and both times I thought it was the emperor. The emperor's not in that room. He can't kill the emperor. That would change history. The emperor... Had literally just yelled, I don't care about your book. No, and that then, was the guard. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay. This whole time, I thought that was the emperor. Okay. That makes a lot more sense, but I thought it was the emperor. Honestly, because I always doubt what I see, you could convince me of it other than the fact that Rudolph has like a no one. Everybody knows how Rudolph dies. And I, I know. Feel like Deborah Harkness wouldn't do that to the story, you know? Fair enough. Your version makes much more sense than mine. My note here is literally, oh, ho, ho, looks like that random vampire from earlier is murdering people in the similar <laughs> similar way to the modern day dude. Yeah. And I just wanted you all to know that I actually wrote down, oh, ho, ho. Very nice. <laughs> but then we do uh, skip to modern day and Knox is on vacation in Prague. Yeah. Edward Kelly's writings are on display in Emperor Rudolph's collection and Peter Knox is there all curious about them seems like an odd place for Knox to be yeah my reaction was literally why are you there Peter Knox yep so that was fun and then we get the scenes from next week which is apparently going to be back in the present day yes it is more Phoebe and Marcus you are excited I am excited about the possibility that it'll be better than last time it has to be better than last time (laughs) I will say there is a tiny amount of 1590 next week okay Cool. So there's that. All right. So the song in this um, ending credits next time on area 
is called A Forest, uh, as performed by, I'm going to say this band is pronounced Kai Kai, Kiki, Kai Kai, sure, uh, original version by The Cure, and I really enjoyed this one. I did not pay attention to it at all. That's fair. This is sort of my area, I guess. Yeah. Well, and it also started later than they, usually they overlap with the ending scene a little bit, and this one didn't at all. And so that's what I noticed, not the song itself. Uh, the the sort of instrumental bit playing is the same song. They just mm. don't get to the lyrics until the credits area. But yeah, okay. you're right. It usually does start a little earlier. Okay. No spoilers this week because everything we would talk about comes up in later episodes. So we're going to address them then. Yep. Sounds good. Um, we would love to know what you think of season two so far. Please tweet at us at Desire Made Real. And you can email us at DesireMadeRealPod at gmail.com. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me and find all my other shows on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. I am Mandy Kay, and you can find this show and all of the other Eloquent Gushing shows, including a brand new one that's coming very soon, at eloquentgushing.com. We are also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing, or you can give me a shout out on Twitter at Mandy Kay. Join us next week as we talk about episode eight, and we find out Phoebe's deep, dark secret of being Princess Leia. <laughs> Until we meet again, remember that with every ending, there is a new beginning. <laughs>